of what's happened today? Well, I, I usually say that uh, economics is politics applied. <laughs> <laughs> so everything, you know, starts politically. Look, it, uh, I, I think it's an interesting because it puts pressure uh, on other ministers who may have been found to be implicated in terms of a relationship with Guptas to follow suit, uh, to deal with their conscience and possibly resign without necessarily being pushed by the president. But at the same time, I think the EFF is going to continue with its pressure on the president to force other ministers uh, to resign. As we speak, they've already released a statement in terms of who should be going to follow suit the resignation of Nancy. So that, that pressure uh, from the opposition will continue. Who have they pointed out, the EFF? Well, they've pointed out Kikab, um, I think the Munkonyane, uh, uh, amongst others, but they, 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 they are onto this sustained uh, uh, pressure. Um, I was talking to one of our professors in politics who, who says that perhaps it's time that South Africa should consider a corruption truth commission where possibly everyone that may be implicated in corrupt activities could come out and make a full disclosure and move forward mm. as was done in other countries. I don't think necessarily that's going to happen because sometimes when people come up and you know, admit to their corrupt activities and the resigns, they are condemning themselves to poverty. So I don't see necessarily that happening anytime mm. soon. But, but I think that pressure will continue and I think there are also possibilities that the state capture commission might also become increasingly a very good political football either for political parties or various factions within political parties to deal with one another all right so uh, again b without uh, 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 going into t too much detail i guess the <laughs> the, the, the issue that uh, the president uh, said just as he was closing, he, he said, I, I want to talk about state capture, and he uh, insisted that there's nobody that's going to be above the law and nobody that uh, is going to be left out and that it was incumbent on people to step forward. Uh, are, are we likely to see uh, some, some people stepping forward now? Because it's, it's out there now. I mean, it's almost as if... Uh, you know, the door is open and he's, he's asking people to behave or to step forward and mm. that they do it of their own accord. Well, I'm not sure if he should be asking or he should be exercising mm. his authority. Uh, I think as a leader who has come into the position that he holds on the basis of promoting good governance, uh, clean governance and uh, dealing with corruption and getting South African tax monies back from where it has been, you know, kept away through corruption, I'm not sure why he should be pleading to people. Perhaps he should take a decision mm -hmm. and exercise his authority in terms of promoting uh, uh, good governance. So I'm, I'm not convinced that a whole lot of people are going to follow the example of Nene and, and resign. Uh, I, I, in any event, I don't think any of the information, which is the most of the information that comes out of the State Capture Commission is not necessarily new in the public space. It's just that uh, this one is dramatic to the extent uh, that it involved the finance minister. All right. The UDM leader, uh, Tandeke, was uh, talking about the PIC in, in particular, and he says that a, a commission of inquiry needs to be set up. And I guess a lot of people need to have faith and trust in this institution once again. Uh, I guess that's an important thing that needs to happen. I think one of the first things that um, must be in his entry when he comes into the office is the stabilization of the PIC. It's important in substance and actually, but it's also important symbolically because um, the PIC is the largest pool of um, consolidated funds on the continent and that it, it is managed properly by the authorities that have oversight over it is exceedingly important to um, it's the collective savings of the public servants of this country and he needs to move swiftly and firmly to stabilize the situation at mm. the PIC. All right, Professor. So, uh, at the same time that all of this is happening, we've got the state-owned enterprises that uh, Praveen Gordon is trying to stabilise as well. They're going to have to work together very closely to uh, get to the point that uh, uh, this country needs. 
Yeah, uh, Peter, in terms of state-owned mm. enterprises, I'm on record. I've said before, non-performing, non-essential state-owned enterprises should either be closed or given away. I mean, something like SAA is a vanity project for politicians. Give the thing away. So I hope that Mr. Mbouini and Mr. Gordon will reach this conclusion jointly. SAA will not fly. No. Literally, it will not fly. No. Now, uh, apparently politicians feel very emotional about seeing SAA planes on airports internationally. Park the planes there and wash them. It will be cheaper than to try and fly them. So it will be necessary <laughs> for Mr. Mbouini with Mr. Gordani's cabinet colleague to go through the state-owned enterprises, figure out which ones must be saved, because some of them must be saved, and those that are non-essential, just close them or get rid of them and save taxpayers billions of rands. Which brings us back to the point you made earlier. There is room for economic stimulus in the current fiscal structure if we stop wasting money on things like SAA. The point you made, we need this desperately, but not wasting it on SAA. The Chinese had a very interesting approach to the family silver, the state-owned enterprises. They looked at the underlying um, sectors in which these um, ailing, they were ailing at the time, enterprises um, were, were operating. They said, how can we restructure things? How can we reconfigure the public sector and make it a contributor to the fiscus and to the economy rather than just sell off the family jewels because, um, because we can? All right. Uh, talk to me about the political pressure because yeah. this man doesn't operate in an office in isolation. Mm -hmm. There's political pressure around him from all sides. Exactly, and, and, and that's the challenge that I'm listening because you know, if you are begin to if you are going to think about Titumbo when as a finance minister in isolation to the collective where he operates, you are likely to get you know uh, uh, things wrong. Uh, ultimately, what Tito Mboweni is expected to implement is not necessarily what he thinks, per se. What he thinks is valuable, but then it's a, it's a basic fact that he belongs to the African National Congress, and therefore he has to implement the resolution of the African National Congress as, of, as, as from Nazareth. He has to work with his collective, you know, within cabinet, uh, and uh, to a greater extent, the ANC government policies on economic affairs um, have not changed in the last 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. So, so it, it, sometimes it's easy to get carried away by the newness of a person into a position and forget that he operates within a given collective, and that is what is going to bind him. All right. Uh, again, we're getting more and more reaction uh, from as many people as we can. Uh, let's uh, hear uh, from another economist, uh, Azaya Matlanga. Matlanga. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on the line. Um, your thoughts on uh, Tito Mboweni's appointment as uh, finance minister? I think in terms of stabilizing the finance ministry, or at least the view uh, that perhaps uh, the finance ministry has uh, in a constant decline for some time, and given the new revelations from finance, uh, former finance minister Tantanene, Tito Mboweni is a great replacement. But I think this needs to be understood in the context of the economic cluster, which means national treasury does not function alone as an institution. It functions together with other government departments that are responsible for for running macroeconomic policy of the country. But he also comes with a very strong and long history in public office, strong credibility in financial markets, both locally and globally, which means he is going to assist in the confidence building that is required to attract the $100 billion that the president has been asking for. So overall, this is a great replacement to Finance Minister Tlantlanini. But another aspect as well is the bar for removing a Finance Minister who would, ha would have been found to have contravened some sort of a law or uh, who is not viewed in good light has been reduced, which means this is good for good governance, clean government going forward. Uh, it, it, would you say that um, Ntlantlanene is, is now lost to us completely or 
can we find a space for him if he uh, gets over his, uh, his hurdles that he's facing at the moment? I think that remains to be seen because uh, we don't know the details of the discussions uh, of the meetings that he said he attended. But I think if we consider over the past two years or so, he uh, oversaw National Treasury during a period where it was under attack politically. And from what we know now, he prevented the signing of a 1.5 trillion uh, Rand's nuclear deal, which would have put South Africa on a, a, a declining path for many years to come. So for that, I think we have to say uh, he did a great job as finance minister, uh, especially given the times that we were operating at. And I'm sure he will surface uh, somewhere within public office. Uh, uh, I think he, has, he still has a role to play in public office. Of course, bearing anything that may come uh, from his meetings that he had with the Gupta. All right. If you were advising uh, Tito Mboweni right now, what's the immediate things that he needs to do straight away? I think uh, it's nothing different to what Tlantlan has been doing. Firstly, is to make sure that we continue with fiscal consolidation, reducing our debt levels, making sure that our credit ratings remain uh, where they are or even improve over the next uh, few years or so. And again, the budget at this point in time has already been completed. Uh, it's only two weeks from the medium-term budget policy statement, so we should not expect a, a new finance minister to come and change the budget completely. That's, that's not how Treasury works. So the budget has been completed. His task is merely to come and reassert the confidence of the investor community in national Treasury in South Africa in the management of our finances so that there is a belief that our finances are in good hands and are being used in a good manner. That's all he needs to do. Okay, Mr. Matlanga, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Dumasani uh, Slope, has this been a stroke of genius on uh, President uh, Sir Ramaphosa's uh, uh, behalf? Is it going to gain him some political capital as he starts marching towards elections? <laughs> A stroke of genius. <laughs> <laughs> look, uh, look uh, for me, pres when I look at the leadership of President Ramaphosa, he, he, he seems to be somebody who doesn't want to rock the boat, so to speak. So he's a bit careful, he engages, he speaks with the stakeholders, and by the time he reaches a decision, it seems to be a safer decision to make. So I think he went for a safe route in terms of a political leadership stance. But I think he's, he is going to face some serious challenges from the left. Um, the, you know, the left-leaning political parties in this country, uh, be, be because they do n they wouldn't necessarily associate uh, Minister Mboweni with, uh, you know, your, your left-leaning type of economic policies or management of state uh, uh, resources. So, so he's going to have a challenge in that regard. But. When it comes to the mainstream business, I think he, he, for them, I think he, it will be a good one. So you won't have a problem in that, in that space. Mm. You know, we've been talking all the positive things about Tito Mboweni, all the great things that he might be able to bring to the table. As someone who knows him, what might be his Achilles heel? What might be the things that he needs to watch in his new job? It will be necessary, as Dumasani explained, for Mr. Mbouwini to remember that he's in cabinet, and that he must take his cabinet ministers with him. Mm. Uh, yes, of course, as I've said in the Reserve Bank, he was the leader, he was the governor, and he took his colleagues with him, but he was the governor. There's only one governor. There are deputy governors and there are senior executives, but there is the governor, whereas here is a minister. It will be necessary for... Uh, Minister Mbouwe, I must get used to <laughs> Minister Mbouwe, <laughs> I still think of Governor Mbouwe, it will be necessary for Minister Mbouwe to build a structure and to get his cabinet colleagues to work with him towards a common goal. That is a big challenge which is different to the role he had mm. at the Central Bank. We will have to see how that role plays out. Is there anything that comes to mind for you, Tandekas? I think one of the urgent things that he must do in-house at Treasury is to redevelop, it's speaking to what Professor Rousseau said earlier, redevelop the brain's trust. 
And um, in order to accommodate what Dumi is speaking uh, about, he would need to fill it with a diversity of thinking so that um, there is the kind of dynamic intellectual friction that you would need to check your, your, your stance against others. So if he's got an internal brain's trust that he can trust, excuse the pun, mm -hmm. and he, um, he makes sure that he, he listens to a diversity of opinions and particularly innovative thinking about how to unplug this economy, then um, he, will, he will, I believe, build a winning team. And this country sorely needs a winning team that can think through these problems and um, test new approaches to intractable problems or problems that we previously thought to be intractable and come up with world leading solutions. It's also a political job as we have kind of hinted and I wonder how good are his politics and political gamesmanship at uh, Boeing? Well look for someone who at some point was the Minister of Labour uh, I would assume that is well vested with the various ideological sections of society. So I, I wouldn't doubt him there in terms of negotiating his way out with a variety of, uh, you know, stakeholders. A and by, by the way, the, the, the strongest combination that you need in any cabinet, it, it, it's, a, it's a good synergy between the president and the minister of finance. And it, together, I think it, they can make that necessary combination. But I, I think he does have the ability to navigate across ideological spectrum. And I think like Tandega says, which is the point which for every time in this country we undermine, it is the capacity of government to perform that matters a great deal here. Mm -hmm. You can put another minister today, you put yourself there as a minister of finance, but the main challenge is the capacity of this government to perform effectively. All right. So political parties are kind of, uh, they seem to be fairly positive with this appointment. Um, the people on the ground, how are they going to receive this? Uh, uh, your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, look, that's very difficult to gauge at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But South African citizens are by and large highly politicized, uh, you know, citizens. They are politically aware, they are economically conscious. I mean, the bulk of this service delivery protest that you see, they know exactly who is responsible for the need for that delivery. I don't think this is going to, they are going to have to open up some kind of affinity with the current appointment of the new finance minister because their focus is on local government service delivery. So if you look at all this Westbury, Kanyamazane, Vuan and Lipop and all over the place, they are basically saying that get local government working. And I think, by and large, that is where the masses are focused at this point in time, not necessarily right at the top. All right. Yeah, um, my feeling is that the average South African, at this point in time, on fiscal and financial economic matters, they are concerned about the petrol price, which is not under the control of uh, the Minister of Finance. And they are really concerned that we might see further tax increases in next year's budget. And mm. uh, if we need to see tax increases next year, and particularly if it's necessary to increase VAT from 15% to 16%, it will be a very important test for Minister Mbouini on how to sell that to his cabinet colleagues and to the general public. Can I take a final thought? Jobs. South Africans are concerned about jobs. If I can have a job, I can find my way in this economy. And we have the kind of unemployment that you find in war zones. So if this minister can address the issue of joblessness in this economy, then I think South Africans would um, sit up and pay attention. Fantastic. To my panel, thank you very much indeed. Thank Tandika Kobule Mbeki, uh, Yanni Rousseau, and Dumisani Shlope, thank you very much indeed for your insights. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, and that's where we're going to leave uh, the program. Uh, you've been watching your story, and of course, the big story of today is that Tito Titus Mboweni, former Reserve Bank Governor of South Africa, is your new finance minister. From us, goodbye. Full view follows just now.